Thank you for listening to Lone Star Community Radio. This program was broadcasted and recorded live from the LSCR studios in downtown Conroe, Texas. Lone Star Community Radio is supported by listeners like you. Donate and sponsor today. For more information on getting involved with Lone Star Community Radio, contact us at lscrstudios at gmail.com or visit us online at www.irlonestar.com. You're listening to the Crime Scene Today. I'm your host, Dan Zitek. We talk about issues current and future facing law enforcement, crime scene, and forensic investigations. Uh, Today with me, I have uh, co-host Ryan Herring, and we're just going to talk about some of the current issues facing law enforcement. So, Ryan, thanks for uh, joining us today, and I'll switch that over there. Uh, We've been uh, out for a little bit uh, just because of uh, different things with the radio station, and so we're getting uh, back into the groove. I actually uh, changed jobs and stuff, so took on some new roles there. You've taken on some new roles in not being in law enforcement anymore, Uh, So, but I know you have some great insight. How how long did you do law enforcement, Ryan? Uh, 24 years. So, and... and, um, so one of the things that uh, one of the challenges and um, I mean, it was before I went to uh, my new employment, but even at the old employment and just in general, one of the issues going on is recruitment and actually people getting into law enforcement. And now uh, both of our agencies were, were from, uh, you know, uh, southern United States and Texas area. Um, in my area, we didn't have some of the similar problems that we're seeing in the north, such as the Seattle area, Chicago area, and that type of thing. So it wasn't so much that we didn't have uh, community support where I was from, uh, but still, as the national news would focus on those, uh, you had people that were expressing that they didn't want to get into law enforcement, right? So we're seeing a lot less turnout at the academies uh, is one problem. And I don't know uh, which chief it was or sheriff that it was, and if uh, I wish I did so I could give him credit for it, but uh, made the comment that there's only so long that we can keep uh, stealing officers from one another, uh, that we still have this finite of officers that at some point, you know, if I take your officers, you take my officers, but I mean, we still just have this certain number, right? So it's, it's getting people interested in doing this. And, you know, I, I've thought about that. I'm not real sure if it's, Obviously, there's an impact to law enforcement. There's no doubt about that. But we also see just an impact in general to certain uh, occupations. I mean, we've seen a decrease in truck drivers. We've seen a decrease in public servants all the way around, uh, fire departments, other places, uh, and just people turning more towards maybe technology and other things they're interested in. I mean, so I know uh, in areas you came from, Y'all had issues with recruiting. So what do you think are some of the problems? Where do you think we're headed? I think uh, some of the problems seem to be, especially around here, uh, you know, Central Texas and specifically uh, Travis County, is you have officers that are, and there's a a more nationalized uh, sentiment to it as well, especially for the, like you mentioned, the news media that focuses on it, uh, where it's turning cops into the bad guys. And if you can't come to work and expect to do your job, which can be a tough job, could be a, um, you know, a a dirty job in in a sense, um, without fear of of getting in trouble, going to prison for it or getting indicted for it. I think that's a huge, um, a huge turnoff when you can go uh, find something else uh, and the risk of going to prison is virtually zero. Um, so I think that's a big turnoff as to why people are doing that is, is they want to do a good job, but then they see how uh, they're portrayed by the media um, and they're like, yeah, I just take my talents uh, someplace else. Well, it, it's the one rare job that if you mess up, you can go to jail, right? I mean, most places you can get fired, uh, you can get written up, you can uh, get a deduction and pay, a demotion, those type of things. But it, it's the one thing where... Uh, we're dealing with a person's rights, and so if we make a split-second decision and someone else judges that that's wrong, then we could be facing indictment, uh, prison, and those type of things. 
I don't know many other professions that that's the case, right? You know, um, even medical, you have malpractice lawsuits, but I don't see many doctors that go to jail over it, right? No, they, they pay their insurance and, uh, you know, go through their, their board steps. And then uh, I'm assuming the majority of the time uh, get reprimanded and then go back to their go back to their practice. So that is definitely a unique and, you know, in this job, you should take uh, we should take those those things seriously um, within the corners of the Constitution and with policy and state statutes of what we're supposed to do and not supposed to do. Um, but I think the challenge comes when not only just messing up, because a lot most people uh, in this profession, if they make a mistake, can can own up, up to it. Um, but where things are lawful and then it gets turned into something that it's, it's not, I think that's where uh, such a huge turnoff is and that keeps people away from wanting to come into this profession. You know, the one thing that um, I found unique, and it seems more current, uh, so recently we've traveled to police academies to, to recruit, to have people come on, and what we've found is that where in the past you would have one hundreds of applicants, if not thousands of applicants, and uh, we're not seeing any. Uh, I mean, a, an example is we had, um, you know, currently... Me. For, uh, for a point there, we had a point that uh, 30 applicants show up after background testing and all the other stuff, we end up with like one or two, right? And so now that's something new. That's something that, that we're experiencing. We went to some academies to recruit and nearly all of them, about 80%, they already had jobs. All right, before they ever graduated, they already had jobs. So uh, out of the ones that are left, you know, for one, you sort of question uh, the quality of the ones that are left, right? Who, who didn't pick them for a job? And then uh, they know that they're a hot commodity. They can, they can choose from pretty much any department and go on over there if, if they're qualified enough to do so. So it's, it's challenging to not lower your standards to fill the spots, right? I mean, before you set high standards and if, if you weren't in the top percentile, then, then you weren't getting on with the department. Uh, now, as time goes on, how many openings do you have until you start lowering the standards to bring people on? And by doing so, you know the problems that come with us lowering the standards. All right, there's, and those kind of things aren't gonna be seen till usually, you know, five, eight years down the line once those standards get lowered and they get in the, those recruits get in get comfortable get get trained and then uh you start seeing the decision making and and, and potential ethical issues that come in from uh, come in from that but um you know i don't know that's an interesting dilemma to solve of needing bodies now uh and then kind of hedging bets on what's going to happen three four five eight years down the line well we, we've seen the results you know, and I, I hate to see them, but it's, it's a live social experiment is, is what we're dealing with, right? So, you know, we'll talk about uh, Seattle in the sense that uh, there's the talk of, of defunding and the police and uh, people leaving and this type of thing. And, you know, as far as the whole defunding police, I mean, the, the principle of it, uh, I understand. The, the principle is that uh, not everybody is a police action, right? There are things such as mental health and social services and these things that possibly could solve problems that police are currently responding to. The problem is those services are still not available. And I know that they see, well, if the police aren't doing it, then they don't need the money for it, but you haven't built those services to begin with. So in the meantime, uh, you can't deplete the police force that's working those uh, to try to build up. I mean, it's the only solution is you add more money uh, to build those services. And I don't know in the future evaluate whether that has made an impact to law enforcement that they're not having to respond that you could decrease. But uh, the current way that it seems to be rolling out is taking the money away to try to provide those services. And the end result that we're seeing is hundreds and hundreds of officers either losing their job. And then you have the fallback of that, that when those officers aren't there, but you need shifts covered. Now you have people pulling overtime. Well, how many weeks are you going to work without a day off? You know, how long is your family going to accept that you're at work, uh, 
day in, day out, and not actually having that work-life balance. And that sort of goes back to what you talked about earlier is at that point, are you not looking for another profession, right? If that's happening across the board, then I can go somewhere else and actually get two days off a week, have some work-life balance, not have to work extra jobs, work overtime. Um, but the social experiment that's happening up there and some of the C's that we're seeing is beyond this lack of support uh, for law enforcement is we've seen nearly a, a legalization of certain criminal activities, right? And so now you have law enforcement that, that wants to do something in their city. They see crimes being committed. They see people being, you know, stolen from and other issues. And the city or, uh, you know, district attorneys in their areas, they're not doing anything about it. They're not accepting charges, you know, and, and this is a, a question I've had, and I think it's sort of a curious question is, so we have laws on the books. If a DA decides that they will not prosecute for certain laws, is there any reprimand to the DA or can a DA decide that in their jurisdiction, uh, theft is legal or prostitution is legal, or let's take it to the extreme murder is legal, right? I mean, by their decision, what recourse, and I, I don't know, I don't know what recourse you have when they say this particular thing, we're not going to do something about it. All right. I think what we've, you know, so, uh, you know, I worked for Austin PD for, for 24 years and uh, inside Travis County, and we've had some interesting issues um, come up kind of as a result of that uh, from, you know, major stuff all the way down to what some consider nuisance crimes, uh, criminal trespass, um, and look at what they're, it goes beyond the prosecution, but look what's happening in Harris County with um, some of the violent crime as it relates to people that have been arrested for aggravated assault, robbery, even homicide that are out on no or low bonds that are committing more violent offenses up to uh, additional murders. Now, in Travis County, we don't we haven't had that uh, to the degree that Harris County is dealing with. Uh, but for us, it's, it was a lot of criminal trespass where it's a law in the books, but um, some in the community uh, just don't don't like that particular law uh, as related to, you know, transients, homeless folks um, downtown. They're coming into shops, uh, clogging up the entrance, stealing things knocking things over, making a mess of the store. And uh, the county and, and district attorneys in Travis County uh, were deciding um, on a uh, a percentage basis, you know, I don't want to speak out of turn, but uh, a percentage basis being um, at least uh, middle of the road, that uh, these were, were not in fact crimes, they were more cries for some sort of mental health help. And um, what we've found in Travis County is that DAs and the way that the Texas, the Texas statutes are written is um, the high, it's a really high bar uh, to have any kind of sanction or liability um, hoisted onto the district attorneys. Um, you know, there's a term that gets thrown around malicious prosecution. Um, what exactly is, is, does that mean? And is it uh, relevant in Texas? I don't know. Um, but, uh, in Austin, you know, there are 19 or 21 now officers that got indicted, uh, for responding to the riots a couple of years ago. And, in looking at that, um, you know, I'm privy to some of the facts with that, not all of them, but, um, you know, all of those were, were cleared by an internal review as being, uh, objectively reasonable. And then the district attorney, um, presented at least 21. I think that there was more because there was a few indictments that, uh, that got no bill, uh, but presented 21 cases to the DA, to the grand jury and got indictments on them. And so um, as a result of that, there's been, you know, the police association and others have looked into to options and really for DAs uh, in Texas, the way the statutes are written, there's just not, uh, not a whole lot of recourse um, with that unless there's some sort of uh, criminal act uh, that occurs either through its, you know, uh, public integrity crime that, that the DA commits or some sort of uh, perjury or something like that. But, uh, and to your point of, you know, the defunding, 
you know, I think there are some that truly believe that uh, taking funds away from cops um, for mental health services is a way to go. Uh, but I think being realistic, um, a lot of that, a percentage of that was looked at as punishment. You know, hey, let's just take the money uh, and show the cops that this is, uh, we have the power uh, to do this because in theory, yeah, it's, it's, it's great. Not everybody is a police response, but, um, and in, in Austin, there's been, they've made some pretty good strides by having uh, mental health call takers available in uh, the 911 center. So someone, uh, and they've been able to divert actually a lot of um, police responses by just sending them over to a counselor on the phone. But when it comes to suicide attempts, um, some other mental health episodes where uh, there might be some agitation, maybe some violence or threats, um, the cops still go to all of those. Uh, they're not taking any uh, calls away from, from police at all. They just took money. And so um, there are some that were well-intentioned, but others I think it was just completely viewed as a punitive uh, measure for that too. Well, and I mean, you bring up some points in the fact that, and it, I hate to say it is what it is, is that, you know, DAs are an elected official, right? And so DAs are in response to voters. And uh, as much as uh, we would like to believe that uh, they do not, uh, and sometimes uh, look towards uh, that in making their decisions, but obviously they do. And so if you have a large outcry from your community saying that we want something done about the homeless or we don't want something done about the homeless, then uh, we're going to sort of see that in the priority of laws. And I mean, a balance of that, right? I mean, obviously, if the community is coming to you and saying, hey, these are problems in our community, then that is something that law enforcement and uh, the DA is going to look into and try to address those specific needs of the community. Uh, but again, to what regard? You know, you brought up the other point of Harris County, and, and that's an interesting conversation as far as, you know, you have uh, seen on the news many times where we have people that are committing murder, that are out on bond, that are out on uh, this. And, you know, uh, in a previous show, we had talked to uh, the Montgomery County DA, and he explained uh, uh, to us in, in great detail as far as the problems uh, in the overloaded courts. And so we talk about Montgomery County, which is way smaller than Harris County being the third largest county in the nation, you know, explaining that they'll have a couple of uh, cases that are going to trial. And they're, they're all three big cases. You may have sexual assault, a robbery, a murder, and only one gets to go to trial that day. Only one. You know, uh, the other two will have to be plea bargained. So you get to decide which one is going to go. Well, obviously, we're, we're doing the murder, right? And so... But if you were to focus on the others, well, the media could say they plea bargain this sexual assault, right? They plea bargain this. And even though uh, right next to Harris County, we have Montgomery County that has large bonds and high sentencing and, and those type of things. But the one thing I, I'm curious about is in Harris County, being that large of a uh, county, I know it's backed up, right? I mean, if, if we're talking about thousands of cases in Montgomery County, then we're talking about tens of thousands in Harris County. And yes, there's more courts. I mean, things are multiplied on, on both sides, but um, you only are allowed so many in the jail. You have a certain capacity before you have broken state standards. So who do you keep in? Who do you let out? And do we do, obviously we would love to say, well, nonviolent offenders, right? That, that's who we're going to kick out. And well, the low level drugs, we're going to kick those out, right? And we're just going to do violent. Well, that sounds great until we're back up with that, right? I mean, so what decisions are we making? And then, so you say, okay, well, it's his first time he was in a family violence assault. He was in this, he knew the people It wasn't to strangers. So this is one that is is on that list right we have a protective order we're going to let him back out on bond he's not supposed to go back there whatever and then he goes back and he kills him right because we've seen that and it makes news headlines that uh, we didn't we be in as far as the da's office letting them out the judge letting them out these type of things um so i don't know the answer i mean i know that uh, it comes across over and over of being lenient and these type of things. But again, I'm glad I'm not sitting in that chair either. I'm glad that I don't have the 10,000s of cases and deciding that this one 
uh, gets a higher bond than this one, and this one is let out, and this one's not. Uh, I mean, obviously, everybody would love the solution of uh, either high bonds, no bonds, put them into a court, uh, protect the community, but then there's reality of the physical building that we don't have, right? We don't have the place to actually put them. And so at what point uh, do we uh, let violent offenders out? Because that's, that's what we come up to, right? I mean, I know no different than, than you being in Austin. You know, uh, when I was working um, in homicide in Montgomery County, there were many times that, that murders didn't make the news. The only reason they didn't make the news is because they already had plenty of them in Harris County. They didn't need to drive down to Montgomery County to cover it, right? Um, so it, it's, it's a problem. And I, I, I don't know if it's increasing, but it seems like it is. It seems like it, um, that the violence seems to be happening more often. I don't remember as many just driving down the freeway and someone getting shot, right? Uh, and that being said, if we can see that there's an increase in violence, then we see there's an increase in violent arrest and we still have no space for them. So, I mean, what's the options on that, right? Yeah, it's a, it, it's a conundrum. Uh, and then, well, what do you do? I mean, there's where some pre-conduct uh, solutions would come into play to hopefully pre prohibit the, the, the crime from happening to begin with. Uh, but, I mean, that, that's a, a very broad conversation of uh, what do you do to get into communities to where these types of crimes aren't happening, um, whether programs or after school or whatever, community centers um, to keep them from happening in, in the beginning. Uh, I know in, in Austin, one of the a very busy unit is uh, the aggravated assault unit here in Austin. Um, and you know, quite frankly, the reason that there aren't any more homo there, the homicide rate isn't higher than it is is due to officers responding, throwing tourniquets on, getting them to uh, medical centers quickly, and then the great work of the doctors at the trauma centers around here. Um, well, they've shown that over, were, the, yeah, over the years, the fact of the increase in technology and medicine that are, are less people getting violent acts against them, or are we saving them, right? Has homicides really uh, I, decreased, or are we just saving them? No, I think it's uh, we've had we've had both. I mean, we've, if you look at uh, the number of actual homicides in Austin, it's uh, we're, we're all time highs, uh, which is not necessarily a record to be proud of. Uh, but then if also if you look at the number of uh, of aggravated assaults and shootings and stabbings and things that require uh, and other trauma that require some major medical intervention, uh, I think those are those are both up. Uh, and it's just fortunate that. Um, you know, like many places, officers carry uh, here all carry tourniquets and chest seals and, and things like that. So there's a lot of on scene uh, trauma care being given. And then, uh, you know, a great job of Austin MS and, and uh, physicians around here that are um, saving that otherwise uh, people that be written off as having injuries incompatible with life. So um, that, that's a, it's, that's interesting. I don't think it's here. It's not a uh, on a scale where one's up, one's down, they're both up. Uh, and just, I think the percentage uh, is down on, on people dying from getting shot, which is a great, uh, great thing. But, um, yeah, what the, what the answer is, you know, I, I don't, I, I don't know. Um, well, it's complex. I mean, I by all means, I mean, it's, it's not a, you know, how, you know, how do you get someone to not enter the criminal justice system, right? How do we right. either give opportunities or address the issue or address the problems, you know, and uh, you know that leads to, and, and I'll, I'll scratch the surface because that's a, that's a whole conversation in and of itself, but as we have uh, these uh, mass shootings and, and all these things, and, and then we see the behind the scenes, right? Oh, well, they had this red flag and they had this red flag. And, and most of the times when you actually listen to those red flags, meaning that you're hearing what they found, them in and of themselves, you would never have been able to act on. Right. I mean, uh, they were acting weird. They were withdrawn. They were, you know, uh, just different things that they, they find. But yeah, as you know, once you see the end result of, of, you know, their horrendous act, then, then you start compiling it. Like what could have something, could sh something have been done. Right. And I think that goes sort of back, uh, returning back to our conversation is addressing the community of finding those mental illness, finding, 
those that you know are getting off track early on you know and that then turns to the other conversation we were having is uh, when you have that person start to get off track how harsh is the punishment you know, uh, do we let them back out because it's their first offense? Do we put them in some type of substance abuse? Do we put them in some type of anger management, some type of counseling? You know, the, the end result, and I know that a lot of people by the, just the programs that I just mentioned, sometimes think that that's a, a soft approach, right? You know, that no, lock them away, put a, you know, uh, uh, put, throw away the key. And, but the reality of it is they're getting out. They're going to get out. Okay. No one's going away forever, except for some of the crimes you and I both work where there's a reason they're never getting out. But a majority are going to get out. So what do we do to make sure that once they get out that we haven't just put them in an environment that's just training them to be better at crime, be better at violence, to encourage their violence or, or whatever, right? You know, I know that I can't imagine uh, working in the Austin area with many of the things that y'all were dealing with, trying to satisfy police function, city leaders, and community that all seem to be at odds over accomplishing the the same goal as everybody has, which is security for the community. Everyone wants to feel safe. Everyone wants to feel secure in their homes. They want to feel safe walking down the street, taking their kids to school. You know, uh, I don't know anyone that is in that situation that does not have, you know, uh, those, those beliefs, those, uh, reasons that, uh, uh, we're out there to begin with as law enforcement. So, um, you know, what exactly, I guess, uh, what were conversations that, you know, you had as far as, I mean, how do you, how do you take all that in and still, still function, I guess. I think the, the hardest thing is, um, you know, just in leadership in general is, is clear direction. And there was a lot of discussion on, um, on clear direction. You've got uh, a policy um, for uh, mobile field force or special response team or, or, or whatever it gets labeled um, for demonstrations and riots. You've got a policy that, that uh, of course, is a guideline uh, that uh, officers are told to look at, be familiar with. And then, hey, if these things start happening, here's the the, in a in a um, in a sterile environment, we sat down, come up with this policy, and decided that these are um, the best ways to approach uh, these type of events and keep everybody safe. We've talked about it, worked it out, talked about scenarios, run it through legal, and we've decided that these are the policies uh, that we should follow and, and some of the tactics that uh, need to be uh, deployed in order to do that. And then when you have situations popping up and officers are being told not to not to intervene um, it creates a little bit of confusion on what the mission what the goals are uh, in order to keep everybody safe Um, you know don't let them take the street well they took the street Um, keep them away from the front of the police station well they came to the front of the police station Um, you know um, setting some things on on fire what do you do with that? Um, go out and grab this person. Well, maybe we right now is not the best time to go out and grab this person. So it was a lot of ebb and flow. But I think the biggest thing was, um, you know, and you had city leadership. And, you know, I've come to look at it with, with the police department's subsidiary of the city itself, right? That's really what it is. It's just a subsidiary of, of, of the parent company, which is, which is the city. And when you have city leaders, um, you know, watching video and saying how horrible the police are doing, well, that filters down and sends messages to the command staff. Hey, we really don't like what you're doing. And then that filters down to uh, the officers that are out there having to deal with it. Um, and, and that's that's been been a challenge. And, and the indictments, like I said, has come from um, those those riots and those uh, those protests or what all these uh, indictments at the uh, DA's office are for. So that's, there's a lot of stuff that's going to be flushed out um over that and in, in the coming uh, years uh, if it ever goes to the trial and there's a lot of debate on that but um i think clear direction is probably the biggest uh, the biggest thing on what is it that we're trying to accomplish what, what's the why what's the main goal and then um you know empower your your subordinates 
um, to actually make those decisions and not have to run every decision all the way up to uh, to the top, which of course creates bottlenecks and then nothing gets done. Well, and that's you know um, you know great leader before had, had said you know you don't you don't tell your your troops what you want them to do, you know you tell them what mission you want to accomplish and you let them accomplish that mission. They'll come up with things that you you never dreamed of coming up with, you know and. Uh, be able to bring that back. For one, you're creating new leaders. Uh, you're giving them the ability of the buy-in of them to own their decisions and to own the end results of those decisions. You know, over the years and in, in the past, uh, when we need to get things done as law enforcement uh, to accomplish a mission, normally uh, you had a lot of support from your administration. You know, those were the ones that sort of you took care of what was on the street. And your administration would explain to your city or your county or whatever uh, why those steps were necessary. You always felt as though you were supported uh, because they were the ones that had the mission, right? And it seems as though uh, more recently that uh, we're, we're having agencies that that's not the case. We're having agencies that uh, whether the communication is failing uh, whether it is not being explained or no one wants to hear, I couldn't tell you the, the uh, one or the other, but I can tell you that there seems to be a disconnect uh, from um, that support and uh, um, a focus on completing the mission, right? I mean, if, if your thing is they don't take the street, well, then they don't take the street, right? I mean, if you got to bring out the van and you start hauling them away and people get upset that they're hauled away, the thing they don't realize is that you know, uh, initially it's, oh, well, you're violating the rights. They, they had a right to be out here where, you know, we're stopping it before it gets to the point where there we have to act even more, that there's more force being used, right? That it, it's something simple. You can't block the roadway, you know, so let's, let's start with there, right? Let's just remove this peaceful protest all about it. Stay over there, yell, scream, hold your signs, don't hurt anybody, and, and we're great, right? That's that's one of the great benefits of being in this country, you know. Uh, but once you start taking over private property, causing damage, causing injury, you know, and we see that coming. We, we've done this for years to know, okay, we're starting to head that way. Let, let's curb this before they're at the front of the police station. Because at what point does it stop, right? At what point, okay, well, don't let them in the lobby. Well, don't let them on the elevator. Yeah. You know, don't, don't let no, them in the... You're... You know. You're 100 percent, 100 percent right. Um, you know, there there were what seemed to be a tide turner with the protest here was all those things that you just said. Um, there was enough uh, enough push uh, by the right people, or should I say, the right people heard the push to where they, all right, you know what? I think this is this has gone on on long enough. And then once that kind of clear delineation started happening, uh, hey, if they take the street, um, they're not gonna do that. And we're gonna, re we're gonna respond and react accordingly. Um, you know, the, the being in this country, free speech, right? Well, for one of the tactics used for a while was to have officers on the front steps of the police station. Um, in that, protesters were using uh, a PA, bullhorn, megaphone, whatever you wanna call it, and then getting in officers' faces with it. Well, um, and that was just seen, well, it's just a city ordinance violation. So, you know, don't, don't, don't worry about it. And um, well, really, if that can cause hearing protection, uh, hearing loss, you know, it started being looked at as, as an assault. They're right in your face using sure. something that's causing you bodily, bodily injury. But the optic of it, if you, you know, snatch this, this bullhorn, this PA out of somebody's hand, uh, well, then that gets everybody stirred up. And I think that's, uh, you know, there's a place for optics, abs absolutely. And you know, whenever you can um, do something and, and keep in mind the optics, then um, I think sometimes we're, we're better for it. But um, sometimes as the, uh, uh, as the cliche goes, no one likes to see sausage get made. And sometimes you have to respond violently to uh, acts. And the notion of a fair fight um, it's, the fair fight does not exist in the law. There's no statute. There's no case law uh, that says that officers have to uh, to be fair. They have to be objectively reasonable, and then for the department standard, act within their 
act within a department. But uh, I think sometimes the optics is what uh, puts us behind the curveball. Uh, and in my own experience, sometimes seeing some things, um, you know, we had a protester uh, that was shot one night. Um, it was actually my first couple of nights down uh, after I promoted to a lieutenant. And so it was a, a welcome to, to downtown of having to deal with a, a, not only a protest, but then a protester that took over the street and ended up getting uh, shot by, uh, by a motorist. And, um, you know, these, these things, the optics are, are not good, but ahead of time, they were down there with rifles. And at the, at the time, police department didn't have anybody down there with matched firepower. It was all worried about SR or, you know, make sure we have riot gear, stay in the back. And the optics of having officers down there and able to respond with AR-15s was looked at poorly, looked at something we don't want to do because, well, it just looks aggressive. And, you know, the national debate over AR-15s. Um, well, turns out later on that night, he pointed at somebody, allegedly, uh, and um, he was killed for it. And thank God he didn't decide to turn that on or some of the other guys that were down there with AR-15s uh, and AK-47s didn't uh, decide to turn that against the, the police. And I believe their comment was, um, if we turn this to the police towards our, if we turn our guns toward the police, they're going to kill us. And so there was at least a little bit of fear uh, there, uh, but the optics kept a response and it was a, a little bit of a, of a challenge to start round, rounding up people that have that gear, uh, that have the active attack training and, and kind of stage them for, for a quick response all because of, of how it would look with AR-15 slung and, and what the crowds would, how the crowds would respond to that, you know, and that's, that's a, an interesting balancing act. Well, and actually what I, what I find sort of ironic about it is that, you know, the reason that we carry AR-15s to begin with, you know, comes out of history uh, and it comes out of Austin, right? You know, we talk about the UT Tower shooting uh, in which someone had a rifle and all the officers had handguns, and no one could get to them. I mean, many years ago, and I'm not saying that that's the AR-15, no one handed out AR-15, but it was uh, an acknowledgement that we were outgunned, we were outmanned, and there have been many instances since then. But, you know, uh, that was a big case in, in Austin that, that drove uh, police to start realizing that, as you said, there's not something as a fair fight. You know, uh, we can't show up with our handguns while they have a rifle and go, you know, uh, like Bugs Bunny and Elmer Fudd saying, time out, I got to go get the right one and I'll be back. You know, right. let's, let's do our 10, let's do our 10 paces and then turn so that we can make sure that this is fair for, for everybody. Right. So, you know, we've, we've adjusted over the years. And one of those adjustments is that we put the proper tools in police hands and, and really it's a reaction to whatever we're facing, right? If, um, for the most part, if you're not bringing rifles to it, we usually don't just hop out with rifles in our hand and go running after somebody. Uh, if we believe there's a threat that they can have uh, a long rifle that we would be up against or they have body armor that uh, pistols would not stop, then we're going to break out the right tools that we can protect ourselves, the citizens, and other officers. You know, uh, But yes, it looks very uh, military, right? Because uh, it is. It is as simple as that. Uh, when other people have those type of weapons, you know, we're, we're having to fight against that. Um, you know, I find it sort of odd uh, when you look at other places the, uh, where it's common. If you go in other countries that sit at the airport, they have AR-15 slung, they have assault rifles at the security checkpoints. It's not thought of anything. You know, uh, we mm -hmm. think about it because it's just not, I guess, normal here. Uh, it's not seen, but... Um, it's it's normal in other places, and you know I don't know if that's good or bad, but uh, it's it's just a, a putting in place the the things that are needed at that time. Oh, well, sure, you have you know New York Times Square uh, officers are patrolling Times Square. They are fifteens uh, all the time, and then um, you know DPS uh, at the at the Capitol um, from time to time would uh, just. Hey, it's it's my turn. I'm gonna go grab a, and I may not have this exactly right, but they would have AR-15s where uh, some would carry them all day. Some would go, all right, and go grab my AR and, and, and walk around for for a little bit. Um, and what has gotten a lot better in um, you know with Austin Fire, Austin EMF, Austin, EMS, Austin PD is our act, the uh, active attack unit, uh, the coordinated active attack unit that they have, 
where you've got medics, firefighters, and police officers um, downtown on weekend nights, um, ready to respond. Everyone's got AR-15s and heavy vests uh, because of the number of shootings that, uh, that have occurred uh, down in the downtown area and where, um, again, uh, our, our public safety partners with fire and EMS uh, and with, with the police officers that were there were instrumental in keeping uh, casualty counts as low as they as low as they were. One's terrible, uh, but they definitely could have been been a lot more. And that is uh, that's something where the perception has been a little bit set aside and and more looked at as this is just necessary. This is a tool. Uh, we've got the the documented history of, of um, shots down here, people getting shot down here, multiple people getting shot down here. And this is just the right tool for it. So that's that's something they've done a really good, really good job with. Well, as far as um, the impact, the, the current impact and ongoing impact, which and that's the part that surprises me, right? The uh, the current, I guess, change in the in the Austin Travis County area uh, of you know people quitting, losing officers. I mean, they're they're behind on getting officers. Is the impact to the tourism? in Austin that I, I have no doubt, you know, there's been a decrease in money, you know, that's coming in there. I mean, don't get wrong. There's still conventions, still people that go there, but I mean, just my opinion, you, you uh, are from there can tell me, but, uh, I don't believe that the tourism is to the level of hitting sixth street and all the areas as it used to be because of that. Okay, sixth street is interesting right now because COVID did wipe out uh, a handful of uh, bars that were there. Uh, and whereas it used to be numerous blocks, uh, maybe five up to six blocks of, of clubs on, on East 6th Street, uh, it's really about one and a half uh, is oh, the wow. concentrated. Yeah, it's one and a half blocks. I mean, there are bars uh, that span more than one and a half blocks, but the true concentration of people uh, occur in about one and a half blocks, uh, which is also where uh, the shootings uh, have, have occurred um, that have actually had victims. Um, now you have other areas. Rainy Street is pretty busy. West Sixth Street is pretty busy, uh, but the the East Sixth Street of, of old is uh, definitely definitely different. Uh, now it does seem that tourism. I mean, the conventions and things are are, are back up. Uh, lots of conventions that are that come to town, but there's also been several conventions uh, that have pulled out due to um, you know public health and public safety and. Um, and crime issues too, uh, where they've written letters and say, "Hey, we're we, we don't feel that bringing our people here are, are safe anymore uh, downtown, since the convention center is is downtown, just uh, you know runs to about Third Street, Fourth Street, and two blocks away from Sixth Street, where um, almost every weekend, non exaggeration, there are shots fired uh, at night." Well, I know in the past, I mean, they would shut down ends of it. There was a large police presence. I mean, uh, it was. You know, it seemed uh, very relatively uh, safe to, to go down and have a, have a nice time and go on your way. Uh, the biggest problem you usually had was a couple of people getting drunk that behave badly when they get drunk, and they know that. Um, and now, uh, yeah, it, it's one of those things that um, whether clientele, the people that are willing to go down there, but, um, yeah, it seems like you hear more violence that's going on. And, and so at that point... Um, you decide to go somewhere else, you know, which is sad because it, it uh, you know, growing up in Texas, that was always a place to go that you could listen to some amazing music and some talent that was coming up and coming. And uh, um, it seems as though that's gone away. And I think that's the impact that they were talking about, about these, what I can sort of consider these social experiments uh, that are going on throughout our country. Um, you know, one that uh, I find it sad, but I find it interesting to, to see the results. And I'm, I'm waiting to see what those end up being it is like Portland that has decided that um, small amounts or usable amounts of cocaine, heroin, meth uh, and such is either a hundred dollar fine or go to some treatment. And again, I think I understand the, the thought process is that we want to get them treatment. But from my experience of years in law enforcement, what I found is if, if someone doesn't want help, it doesn't matter. They're not going to benefit from the treatment, right? And I also know many that they just pay the $100. Uh, and so at that point, you've, you've taken um, this dangerous drug 
And we've seen uh, the results in Seattle and Portland and the um, reaction of the community, uh, the reaction of homelessness and uh, the job rates and those things. And again, I can't imagine uh, being an officer from that area, uh, literally just walking by people dealing drugs, uh, mm -hmm. shooting up, uh, you know, using different uh, uh, illegal narcotics. And I'm not talking about smoking marijuana. I'm talking about, you know, hard stuff mm -hmm. and just walk by because there's, you've been told, don't enforce it. You know, and again, I sort of refer it back to a social experiment. I, uh, I'm curious uh, to see what happens with them mandating treatment and those type of things. But uh, uh, I, just from my years, I'm pretty sure how I think this is going to end up. And we've sort of seen so far some of the consequences from those decisions. Uh, but we've also seen a, a, a huge avalanche effect uh, of officers leaving because they can't, they're not allowed to do their job. And now you're starting to see the impact of not only um, the drugs and crime, but what happens when there's no one there to provide that safety. It's, yeah, I mean, I, I think we're on the same page of where it's going to go. Um, you know, what, what's happening in some places is you have elected officials like a district attorney and, and, you know, in Travis County, you have the district attorney that deals with felonies and uh, public integrity crimes. And then you have the county attorney that deals with, with misdemeanors. So you've got just two separate entities looking at different levels of offense, um, both uh, who are saying, yeah, this is a, uh, an offense under state statute, uh, but we think it's better served someplace uh, in some other some other way so we're just going to reject uh, the affidavit reject the charges uh, not really say we're not going to prosecute uh, but we're not going to prosecute right. and so you have um, you, you have police departments that have policies about you know felonies occurring in their presence and drug use and what to do um, and then DAs saying hey if this is if you arrest somebody with a crack rock just know we're not going to do anything with it. And so then you then you get into this philosophical debate over uh, you're statutorily allowed uh, to make this arrest because it's still a crime, but you the DA has made it pretty clear that they're not going to prosecute. So is it worth making that, that arrest? Uh, I mean, that's an interesting uh, debate, especially if you end up getting into an altercation with someone uh, end up hurting them or get hurt knowing that uh, charges aren't going to be filed on them anyway. Yeah. No, it's not going to go anywhere anyway. And then, you know, uh, are they likely to take any kind of resisting um, offenses because it started out as something they're not going to prosecute anyway? I would say that that uh, uh, that's a really low likelihood. So the only person that's opened up to any kind of scrutiny, really, uh, is the officer uh, for for making that arrest that he's been kind of uh, maybe not through the department uh, because the department's you know hey this is still a law on the books uh, but just know this is what the DA says about it so that's a hard balance to walk uh, on uh, not only for a department but for officers who are seeing things that they know are violation of the law but uh, have been um, pretty clearly um, indicated by the county and the district attorney's office that. They're just not going to prosecute for for those. Well, and I think that leads back to, to what we were talking about with uh, what we've seen in Seattle is officers just walking by, right? Not even interacting, yeah. not even, you know, having more of a conversation uh, about it because, again, why? Why would I go over, possibly get stuck with a needle, get in a fight, uh, go through all this when the end result uh, in – uh, how it's been described by some officers is why would I do it if the community doesn't care? If you don't care about it, why am I out here killing myself, you know, uh, doing these things, right? And uh, again, right. whether that's a reaction from the community, whether it is a reaction of minimizing the amount of cases, uh, whether it is trying to find another solution 
because we feel that incarceration and the criminal justice system is not the solution to that particular issue. You know, I don't know, as we said, that's a, that's a much bigger and broader conversation, uh, which, you know, we are going to continue to have uh, numerous conversations on that uh, and on other topics and things. We're going to wrap up today. And, um, uh, and I appreciate uh, Ryan for joining me as he's agreed to uh, co-host the show and be here on a couple of occasions to talk about different topics. And, and I appreciate your wealth of knowledge and, and certainly just the different areas that we work and different years that we've served. Uh, uh, we hope that uh, we can share some of that information that benefit other areas. And, you know, as the media throws things out there, one of the reasons for the show is not only to have subject matter experts on to talk about uh, current issues facing law enforcement, forensics, crime scene investigations, but it's uh, to actually share that from a law enforcement point of view, of uh, things that uh, we've dealt with from just experience and to share those things, uh, to bring up new topics and uh, uh, share that not only with our, our law enforcement, with our community. So uh, Ryan, thanks for joining me and for uh, listeners out there, uh, we will I'll be bringing you another show soon. Uh, make sure you check your calendars, depending on what uh, area of law enforcement you possibly are in. You have the Crimes Against Children Conference that is happening in Dallas. Uh, that's going to be in August. A uh, huge conference. If you've never gone and you deal with Crimes Against Children, you need to make that a point of your career. It is huge. It is beneficial. Uh, you have the um, IAI for Crime Scene Investigators International Conference is happening also in August. Uh, that one is in Omaha, Nebraska this year. Uh, registration is still currently going on. And for those that are dealing with property and evidence, you have Tape It that's going to be coming up uh, in October. So uh, make sure that you register for that. And if you are a leader in law enforcement, the International Association of Chief of Police Conference, that is going to be in Dallas this year, also in October. So all those conferences coming up. Uh, COVID uh, seems to have lessened where people are willing to have these in-person conferences. We can network again and share our information and just uh, benefit from uh, the knowledge of others. And we look forward to it. So thank you for tuning in.